back to CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. Let's look at the final material for week six, and you have all the knowledge that you need to do the animation project. Obviously, with more time, you could do more advanced things, but there are deadlines. And I have updated the assignment as per the votes that the deadline is the 30th. It was going to be the 16th, but you all voted or the majority voted to go to 30, June 30, July 30th. So uh, there will be that, that will be the deadline, but we will continue to do the next material moving forward, which will then segue into the next three weeks of doing game stuff. So learning what we need to know about gaming, we've climbed up to the point where we know the software enough, the tools, the concept of scenes and camera and all of that, drawing frame by frame, et cetera. Well, the game portion of things is uh, going to start to talk about interactivity, going to talk about coding. And Adobe Animate can let you write code, uh, simple code to advanced code to make games. And so starting next week, if you're here in person, that'll be the best thing because I've got a whole cabinet full of tablets. We're gonna be making games that actually run on real devices. Now you can make Android, or iPhone games, but just to keep it easiest in class, I'm gonna focus on making the Android version because it'll be too hard to plug in the iPhone and switch back and forth and all that stuff. So I've got a whole cabinet full, just like I check out the pen tablets, I've got a whole cabinet full of Android tablets ready to use, which assistants actually, we need to start charging those up. So maybe at the moment, if you can take them out and there's a power strip there and find a place and start just charging uh, some of those a little bit at a time. So we've got a whole set of Android tablets that we're going to let you borrow here in person. And if you have them at home, of course you can use your own device at home. It does take a little bit of setup. I will talk about that in the lecture, uh, how to set it all up. But for us here in person, they're ready to go. That'll be next week, creating interactivity in Adobe Animate, adding to what you've learned this week. And this is going to be a game. There's many types of games, of course, and I'll show examples from previous semesters, but this is going to be more of an adventure type of game, a um, click, uh, a, a click, what, what do we call it? The click and move or the adventure type of game where there's uh, screens and environments where you interact with the environment, you move from screen to screen. So it's not gonna be like a fast FPS kind of game or an MMO type of game. It's gonna be a screen full of interactive content. You click and drag, move stuff, solve a puzzle, move to the next screen, that sort of thing. So Animate can make any type of um, project, movie, a game project, but the, um, the thing is that we have uh, the capability and the time limit to, to work with. So actually, Angie, let me give you this because the there is a there is a charger. Uh, let me do the key for the other cabinet. There is a multi-pronged charger uh, power strip on the other uh, cabinet there. Power strip on the right side somewhere. Just plug a bunch of tablets in. <clears throat> So before we get to the game stuff, we've got a little bit more animation to do. So I'm going to go into animate and we're going to work on parallax scrolling background. So uh, let me briefly pull up the, the uh, resource here where we've got uh, examples and the assistants were putting in some very useful uh, more parallax stuff in the chat. So here's a couple. Uh, there's one that's 14 minutes long. There's one that's two minutes long. So I'm not gonna go through this uh, minute by minute. I'm gonna point out a couple of things and then we'll do our own version. And this one that's 14 minutes long is very nice. I'm gonna play without sound. But just to kind of show you, the idea is that that's a parallax scrolling background. You've seen that type of background before, especially in a side scrolling game. 
this will look nice for our project as well. And notice what's happening. There are these various elements that are creating a pseudo three-dimensional space, often called 2.5D, right? There's 3D, there's 2D, this is 2.5D, because there's a little bit of depth. And what's happening is that it looks like in the distance, there's, there's stuff. So this 14 minute long video, the, uh, the presenter is gonna show you step-by-step -step how to do it. I'll show you a version of it. And the big idea of what's happening here is multiple layers moving at different speeds. If we are locked into 24 frames per second, thank you. If we're locked into 24 frames per second, that is not changeable. Our movie always works at 24 frames per second. The way you get faster and slower speeds is, what, is, what have I said before? Um, faster animation, less frames. Slower animation, more frames. So we're locked into 24 FPS, but between keyframes, the amount of frames in between that means faster or slower. So if you've got one keyframe on frame one and one keyframe on frame two, that's going to move very fast. But if you've got keyframe one, keyframe two, and there's 50 in the middle, that's going to move slowly. More frames between keyframes, slower animation. Less frames between keyframes, faster animation. And what's happening here is that. So we've got a background layer of the moon. We've got a mid-ground layer of the, uh, those scary trees. We've got a foreground layer of the actual level and platforms and stuff. At least three layers. Many more can be made, of course. You can do this with two layers. It doesn't work with one layer. You need at least two layers, probably three. If you want to do more, sure. But each one is moving at a certain speed by having a certain number of frames. Uh, the uh, moon layer might, might move 10 frames, the trees layer might move 30 frames, and then the, um, the uh, ground might, work, might move 50. So just different amount of frames in between each. And so watch that on your own. The, it's a very good video also explaining. Let me see if I can, I think they have, here we go. So. Let's look at this. There is the stage. Let's say it's 1920 wide. There's a further background element, the furthest background element, the moon, that is slightly larger than the um, stage, maybe 500 pixels. Then there's a mid-ground, which is about half or double, that is, so 1900 times two, so there's about double the length of that. And then there's the uh, running ground, which is uh, around three times, maybe four times. So this is in kind of an easy way to think about it. Uh, you have your main size stage double for one la layer and then triple or quadruple for a third layer. And all of those things are gonna motion tween all in the same amount of time, but with different amounts of um, uh, frames. And then that's gonna cause the, the speed of each of these. So we're gonna do our own version of this in animate here. I'm going to create a uh, brand new file as usual, full HD, 24 FPS, gray background. We're gonna save that. work in progress file, control two to zoom out to be able to see everything. Save that. I'm gonna do something similar to what the um, video shows a moon layer, trees and cemetery layer, the ground layer, a variation of that. So layer one here, let's rename that to uh, background underscore far, or maybe just BG far. This is the furthest background and BG middle and BG close. So we'll start with three layers, BG mid, Our background won't be mid, it'll be good. And then BG close. 
So we made three layers. Far, middle, and close, or near, whatever you want to call these, or you can call them with what's visible on the screen. Whatever helps you when you name your layers, when you name your objects, whatever helps you. There's no wrong answer, except that you have to stick within the limits of no spaces, special characters, that sort of thing. Keeping it lowercase is also helpful. So in the far background, I'm going to create a, um, a some sort of far level. Actually, on that one, it's just going to be the, okay, for that one, uh, it's going to be clouds and maybe the moon. job on that later, but there is the, the background far layer. Now, this is all going to animate. I could make each of those clouds animating at their own speed as well. That's even more complexity. We'll start this way first, that that whole background is going to move. But since it's the furthest background, it's going to move the least. But if I want things to move to tween, this needs to be a symbol. So I did it here where, okay, I got it ahead of myself. I started to draw the background on the timeline. Um, if I drew it on a, on a symbol on its own, that, that would have been slightly better. The problem of dr drawing it all in a symbol, however, is that you don't know how it actually looks like on the main timeline. So there is a value to setting up a... Um, setting up the uh, background visible on the actual timeline to see it in your design and then turning it to a symbol. To turn it to a symbol, um, I'm gonna click on, the, on that first keyframe in the timeline that selects everything. So now everything is selected. With the selection tool, I'll right click any of those things that I drew, right click, convert to symbol or just F8. Although that is about to become a symbol, I will set my registration to center, and I can call it the same thing as my layer, BG background or BG um, moon. So I started drawing it on the far background. Then I selected it all, F8, converted it to a symbol. Maybe now that it's a symbol, I can double click it in the library, polish it up a little bit, maybe fill in colors a little bit. Not too complex, but this is just showing that the um, showing that the yeah background can still be fully edited now that it's its own symbol And then it changes in my main timeline. Now, positioning this and such, basically the way this works is things that are further from you, further from your point of view, move slower, just like in real life. Have you ever been on a car trip? You look out the window, let's say you're the passenger, you're looking out the window to your right, and then the things that are close up the road are just zooming by at 65 miles an hour or so. But the things, the mountains that are far away, they move so slow. Eventually you realize, oh, that mountain that was at my visibility here now is way over there. We just traveled some amount of space. So same thing with this furthest background element, it's gonna move some amount of space. So lean it over a little bit to the right. Um, 
Obviously, the direction that we're going will depend on which way it's going to animate, but I'm going to start these things on the right and move to the left. It's going to be kind of backwards. Things are going to animate from the right to the left, which is going to make it look like the character's moving to the right. We'll see if that doesn't quite make sense. We'll see it when we actually do it. So we've set up that background. Lock that layer in your middle background. I'm going to draw here round plus like tombstones and stuff, I guess. I want to fill in this color. Remember, you need to have the um, to have the shape closed. On that uh, middle layer, click the frame, the keyframe to select everything. While it's selected, you can press F8. Memorize that. That becomes a symbol registration in the center. I'll call this BG uh, ground, or what do we call it? BG uh, graves. That's its own symbol. I'll clean it up a little bit in, now that it's a symbol, I can go to the library and clean it up a little bit. See, gotta close those so that I can color them. Drop some sort of floor color. And tombstone color. I notice the color on my particular screen changes so much. Uh, based on the projector here in the room, the colors are really shifted. So again, I can work on this for a long time to get it perfect. I'm not going to go too far, but as you get practice with all of this, get faster and faster. Keyboard shortcuts again from last time. V to move your lines. Then maybe drop your color in, K, bucket. So obviously, if I drew these right the first time, sure. But oftentimes, you will need to go back in and refine your drawings. That's how it's done, even for professionals. If you watched the um, videos that I've had for you, there's a, there's a few from BAM Animation, and they are professional animators, and they talk in there about this cleanup phase takes so long, whether it's simply drawing or even animating, it takes a long time. And if we weren't working with a digital animation, you'd still be doing this by hand with paper and pencil and such. So that's a far element. And then the closest element will be maybe the platform and stuff that we're running upon. Uh, so on this one, lock the mid-ground layer, go to the closest ground layer. I'm going to draw there. Here, So here's another tip on things. Uh, you can uh, also give a sense of depth by the thickness of your line. If you vary the thickness, it also gives you that sense of perspective. So maybe closest to me, it is the uh, thickest line. Middle ground, it is middle thickness. And furthest, it is thinnest. So knowing that, I can go back to my 
uh, moon background and make the lines a little thinner. One way to do it is this way. If I go back to the moon, double click it. If I control A to select everything, remember with your selection tool, or it's up on modify as well, modify, uh, modify somewhere, but you can also with the selection tool, got the smooth, or you can smoothen things. Smoothening things might also change their character a little bit. You may or may not want that. So the point of that is the, the things that are furthest could have, could be um, thickest line. The things that are closest could be thickest line. So thinking about that, I'm going to, in my middle or my closest layer uh, with a thicker line, draw some simple platforms. I'm gonna keep it very simple. Let's say just these sort of jumping platforms. Platforms, let's say. Character's gonna jump between these pits, these platforms. So the uh, that's being drawn on the close layer, of course. Make sure you're on the right layer. That needs to be turned into a symbol. So clicking the clicking the um, keyframe selects it all. Press F8. Turn that into a symbol. BG platforms. Clean it up a bit in my library. Zoom out. All right, so this is our scene. There's no animation, of course. I'm building up a scene that to the viewer, it looks like a complete environment, but to us, it's made out of three layers. Remember, putting things on their own layer gives you more control in animation. When we were animating that little face character last time, I figured out, oh, I should have put, the, I should have put its hat on its own layer so that the hat wiggles a little easier. So the more things you put onto their own layer, the more complex it'll be to work with, but the more control you have. In order for this to work, to animate and such, on the video, the tip is basically duplicate or have more content on a layer as you get closer. The, the most furthest background is approximately the size of, the, of their stage or slightly larger. Then the middle ground is twice as large as your background. And then your, four, your closest element is three times or four times larger. So knowing that now, I need to further edit my symbol, symbols. Uh, the the uh, graves layer, if I were to double click it to edit it, okay, I'm gonna edit it, but I can't really see how much more now, don't do this yet, but I can't see how much I need to um, do this yet, but I'm going to need to expand my background some amount. You have to have some amount of background that is not visible that will become visible for this parallax effect to work, but I don't know how much to add because when you double click your symbol to edit it, it hides everything else, and then you only focus that symbol. Well, there's another way to do this as well. If you double click on the symbol while it's on the stage, you can see it versus everything else. So I'm gonna lock all my layers and unlock the mid-ground layer with the select tool. If you double click that symbol on the stage, not in the timeline, uh, not in the library, if you double click it on the stage, the, others, the, the other things fade out so that you can see in context, I'm editing this symbol. How does it relate to what's on the screen? Because if I double click it from the library, I, I don't see anything. 
that, that's a that's a trick to that's a tip to do this right. Uh, so double click it within the main timeline, zoom out some amount like that. And now I need to know that approximately double, I need double the size of the of the stage. And I can do this two ways. I can manually draw more that I need, or I can select all, control A, select all. I can then edit copy, control C, and then edit paste in place paste in center. So I can copy and paste what's already there. I'm going to try it that way. Copy and paste in center, paste in place, doesn't matter. And now that, while it's still selected, I can move it over, make it more. Make it twice as large. Now that, of course, is going to give me the exact same that is going to give me the exact same uh, background there, which I may or may not want. I kind of know that double or so of the amount of space is this far. I can set a guide. Or view rulers. I can do a little math as well. The width of my project is currently 1920. I want double of that 1920 times two, that's 3840. So 3,900, 4,000, whatever, rounding it up. Um, some amount far off over here, let's say 4,000. If I make a guide that is at around 4,000, I'll be sure that I am making enough of a background that is, that is gonna fit within when I do the animation. So let's say I didn't do the copy and paste. I want to manually handcraft more background. Well, a guide here, view, blurs. From the left side, drag a guide. I believe you can also place a guide exactly where you want. Let me do that again, modify or view, insert, guide, guide. Believe there is an icon or a menu item to add. You can place a guide exactly where you need it. You can do you can do it that way, I guess. If if you start to drag a guide out of the top or bottom, let's say you just drop it there for a moment. You double click your guide, and you can say, okay, I want it at exactly four thousand. Is it thirty eight? 40 if I want it exactly doubled. You can eyeball it. You can just drop it where you think is a good spot. You can place it precisely. So now I need to so know that I need to have enough background to go that far. Some more background, some around there. It's not exactly the same. Oh, there's probably trees on this graveyard. The eyedropper to select your previously used color, fill it in. There was the original land that I drew plus new land, but that in the middle there, that line, I don't want it. Do the usual cleanup. A dropper, keyboard shortcut, letter I. So you can grab your color and drop your colors in. Yes, there's seven pixels that are not filled in there. If I zoom in 2000%, I'll see it. But when your project is at 100%, it might not be visible. It may be visible. This is the, this is the uh, details that depending on your time, your efforts, your deadlines, et cetera. Are you gonna stress over every pixel? I'm not saying don't care about your work, but I'm saying you have limits. 
deadlines, mental health, all of that. So pick and choose your efforts. Version one, it's a little rough, but then on a version two, that's when it's all nice and polished when you've got the time. Right, the point of this is the middle ground is double the size of the stage. All right, so then for the um, closest level, it's going to be at least three, or if you want it even faster, four times the original stage. So right now I'm currently editing. If you look on the top left, uh, this shows you you're in this symbol, which is on this scene. Go back. You double click it from the library, it'll just say, you've got a symbol, go back to wherever. But when you're editing the symbol in place, double clicking it there, it shows you in detail, oh, this symbol is on that scene. And so then the foreground element. Uh, I'm going to lock all my other layers. I'm going to unlock my platforms. Double click the platform. The other stuff fades out so I can focus here. So I know that at 4,000 is double. If I do a little math calculator here, let's see. My stage is 1920 times three. I'd have to go up to 5,700 if I wanted it to move faster. Um, 1920 times four. That'll be 7,600. So let's say 7,000. So let's say at 7,000, I want a guide. So I can start to drag out a guide, just drop it, double click it, set it to 7,000. So I need to, I need to know I go, I need, I need to go that far to make platforms. I can either drop platforms. In this case, I'll copy and paste. Maybe it's the same kind of platform. If I make a selection of the of those platforms, control C, control V, move it into place. It's still in memory. You don't have to copy again. People do this all the time. Computer copy and paste works by you copy something, it stays in memory until you replace it with something else. So it's still in memory. Just paste again. You don't have to go back, copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. Save yourself effort. It's already in memory. Just paste it in again. Go that far, it's a little bit over, fine. Or maybe my final one isn't necessary. The platforms will, where my character is going to jump through. or times bigger than my stage. The scene one. So it takes some setup, multiple layers. X amount of width of the size of the thing. One, two, four, etc. Then we need to set up the animation. So everything's running at 24 frames. So I'm going to lock everything. Everything's running at 24 frames. That cannot change. What's changing is the size of your elements. And they're all moving on the same time. So I'm going to go to five seconds, I'll probably need more, but on five seconds, frame 120 for all three of your uh, layers, for all three of those, select them all like this, the select all, uh, click and drag to select all, and then F6 
which is right click, convert to keyframes. So I've six them all. Something's gonna change from keyframe one to keyframe two on frame 120. Starting with my furthest background, unlock that one. And what's gonna change there is it's just gonna move over some amount. Do too much, but in my case, what I did was back on frame one, my furthest background is slightly to the right of my stage. My second keyframe is slightly to the left. So it's gonna move, it's the furthest thing, it's gonna move slightly. I'm using the arrow keys here. Instead of moving the mouse and accidentally moving it up and down, you can use the arrow keys to precisely move it in any direction. You can also use shift arrow keys to move it faster, but I've moved it slightly to the left. By right clicking between any of those keyframes, create a classic tween. Play. That background is going to move very slowly in five seconds. It's the furthest element. Lock the far background, unlock the mid background, frame 120. Be careful here, frame 120 of the mid background. I'm going to move that to the left. I can use my uh, my mouse, which um, I'm afraid that I might move up and down and therefore kind of make it look weird. You can hold shift while you while you use the mouse to, to keep it lined up so it doesn't go up unless you really go up. But if you hold down shift while you move left and right, it should stay stuck in place pretty well. Or I kind of like better if you hold shift plus the arrow keys, slightly slower, but then that way you know that you're only moving left and right. If you don't hold shift key, it's going to move pixel at a time. If you hold shift, it'll move many pixels at a time. And what I want is on the frame 120, the second keyframe, I want to move the middle ground layer some amount to the left. Obviously not all the way because then you fall, fall off the edge of the world unless you want that effect. So some amount there. First keyframe, the middle ground is way to the right. Second keyframe, it's way to the left. All right, tween it for me. Right click, classic tween. If I play it, it's moving at a pace. Got our third layer. Unlock, open up the close layer, frame 120 there. So obviously make sure you've got keyframes. I said that a moment ago, you, you need to have keyframes. Change happens, so you need keyframes. Um, so that's gotta move all the way to the left. That's an even larger image. So use your shift arrows or your mouse, keep it all lined up or else it'll look out of place. So I guess when I copied and pasted and moved it over, it still moved. It still kind of fell down a little bit. Uh, I probably should go back because this is all, yeah, see that's slightly drooping down a bit. Um, well, no problem. After I do the animation, I can always go back to my symbol in the library, put guides, line it up perfectly. I'll do that later. The important part right here is that I am moving the uh, this closest layer further to the left, some amount, right around there. First keyframe, it's all the way to the right. Final keyframe, it's all the way to the left. In between, classic tween it. Test it. Parallax. I can further refine things. Maybe, maybe the furthest background is moving a little too subtly. Maybe I want it to move slightly more than the background. One way that we get this sense also of depth is how do the elements overlap? When I drew my original moon layer, I hadn't drawn the tombstone layer. So nothing's overlapping. One trick to create that depth is make things overlap. I'm gonna go back. 
a few more clouds that are lower in the horizon so that they're behind this element here, don't they? Make platforms. I'll go back to my tombstones layer and draw things a little bit lower down here. So that, well, right now, because it's playing in a loop, you see the, uh, the jarringness of, oh, it starts over it. The animation ended. With a background, you can design it so that it is a looping background, which this is not. Or you can design it as, you know, a, not a looping background on purpose, depending what you're trying to do. Often with a game, a side-scrolling game, there is a looping background. You're not going to draw, you're not going to add, you know, a thousand uh, pixels of stuff. You can have it loop if you draw, if you draw it right. Uh, I'll probably show a looping background in a bit, but I'm not caring. I'm not caring about a looping background at the moment. Anyway, it wouldn't work because that moon is never going to loop. That furthest element, technically, that's never going to loop. But those platforms jumping on those can loop over and over. There's just a simple element. Maybe the um, tombstone layer that can loop, but you can't do both very easily. That I want seamless looping as well as parallax. It's kind of either or. And I would say for your assignment, don't worry about doing a seamless looping background. You're going to have this type of background where it's not designed to loop, but the point of it is that it's got parallax. So to make it more parallaxy, I am going to um, either in the library or on the timeline further refine my drawings. I'll go back to keyframe one from my far background, unlock it, double click it. I'm going to draw a few more things lower in the horizon. I know that there's going to be a tombstone there. So maybe a couple things low in the horizon. Back to scene one. So then now got those foreground elements behind a background element. It gives the illusion of depth. With the uh, tombstone layer, I can unlock that, double click it to edit it on frame one. Maybe what I can do here, instead of having a flat color, I, I didn't really mention it too much in class. Maybe you figured it out as you explored the app, but you can do gradients. Maybe I want to do this where it's a, it's a color and then it fades to black. Because if I'm kind of jumping on pits, maybe there's bottomless pits, I don't know. So maybe I want that color to fade to black. So we have the paint bucket which fills in a solid color, but holding down the paint bucket gives you fill in interior color, fill in exterior color. And then we've also got um, up on properties, this is going as a solid color where I can do gradients. See the easiest way. Radiance. I can start with one of the, um, I can start with a basic gradient. Notice I've got the paint bucket tool over on my properties. Color, if I go with the basic black and white, uh, we'll be able to pick our own colors in a moment, of course. But with the black and white one, if I click one time, okay, it added a gradient that way. That's that's not what I want. That doesn't make sense. Uh, I want it to go 
top to bottom. If I just simply click, it'll say, yep, there's your gradient. No, actually I want it in a direction. If I click, uh, if I click and drag with the, the gradient, So didn't there used to be a gradient tool? Did they hide that tool or did they integrate it? There it is, I guess it's two separate tools now. Okay, so if I drop in, for example, a basic gradient color, I want the gradient to go a certain direction. I can transform the gradient, whereas we have free transform tool If you click and hold it, you have gradient transform tool. You have a tool hidden within a tool. Clicking on the gradient gives you this control, these control um, handles, so that you can alter various aspects of the gradient. Zoom out for that. Let's say something like that. Selected gradient, black and white, then uh, gradient transform tool, and I played around with the control points. Now, obviously, I don't want uh, black and white, I want my own colors. Well, you can, of course, define your own colors up on the um, up on the little color panel over here. We've got two of them. We've got the color swatches, which are built-in colors. Then we've also got the color mixer over here. So this is showing you've got this fill color, which is a gradient, which is a linear gradient or radial gradient or solid color or none. When it's a linear gradient, it's going to go in a line. And this is the representation of the colors from this color to that color. So here I can say, okay, actually start me from maybe some color there, then click on that one, go over to some other color there. So your gradient going from one color to the other, um, I can place where that is happening. This is with the gradient transform tool. Editing the symbol. So then everywhere that the symbol is used, it automatically inherits it. The gradient slightly up as well. I want more darkness there. Now that I know this, maybe I want my background to also be something like that, where it's um, not as just a solid color, but if there's a moon there, what about the moon radiating out a color? You see, I'm getting also a little bit of perspective in terms of, we've got a light source of the moon, and if the, if the moon is radiating lights down to the ground, remember when you talked a little bit about coloring, things that are closer to the light source are brighter, Things that are further are darker, from light to dark, because the light source is there. Well, the background, the things that are closest to the light source might be brightest, and the things that are furthest from the light source might be darkest. I want to make a gradient that radiates out from the moon. Going back to scene one, saving, locking all my layers, unlocking the far background. Now here you have to think a little bit more because breaking it down, my background here, hiding the other layers temporarily, my background here is made out of the moon, some clouds. I can't drop a um, radiant here there's nothing to catch it. I need a shape to then put color into it. 
because I can't put a gradient in the background. My document only allows a solid color. I can get around by that by having a shape that is a background of the background in a sense. And in there we've got a gradient. So I'm going to double click my far background on the uh, timeline. Actually, uh, I'm going to show I'm going to show the other items because I want to see what I'm looking at. Then I'm going to double click on the timeline. We'll fade things out a little bit. So within the symbol here, I've only got one layer. I'm going to put I'm going to create a new layer, put that at the very bottom because that'll be the background of this background element. On that bottom layer, that's where I'm going to make a gradient radiating out color blend. So new layer, put that new layer at the bottom. I'll think of a good name later. But what I need is a basic. First, I'll start with a basic just to see it. I'm going to put a basic uh, square. So I'm in the symbol of the moon. Your background the moon, be careful that you're paying attention to what layers you're in. In that symbol, in that symbol, I made a brand new layer. Put that at the very bottom, maybe lock the other layer just so that I don't accidentally edit it. In there, I put a simple square. Scary, but that's in the far background. Okay, and that's also showing when it moves around. I need to make it slightly larger because when my animation ends, see how it goes off the edge. So always be testing your work. Slightly larger over here. Now I want a blend of colors like I did with my floor. So selecting the um, solid shape, I can go up to colors. Now I don't want a solid color. We had linear gradient, we want radial gradient. So this is gonna radiate out in, in, a, in a kind of a circle. I want it to go from maybe some kind of light color. Some dark color. But I want that to come from the moon. So with the gradient transform tool, which is hidden below the free transform tool, I get these control points where I can further change various aspects of it. The main aspect to change is the starting point. So I can grab, there's just a lot of ways to control this but I want to grab that and start it from here. I want that to reach all the way to the edge. Okay, well, just grow the size. Maybe I want it all the way to the edge. Maybe I don't want it all the way to the edge. This is all happening on its own layer. This is in the symbol of the moon layer. On its own layer, I have a basic square shape, but the color in there is a radial gradient, then I tweak the radial gradient so that it looks like the color, the light is emanating, radiating from the moon, the color drops off. Back to scene one. We have a linear gradient on the tombstones. There's the light from top to bottom getting darker. I could go into these individual tombstones and do something very similar. I can drop a linear gradient on those tombstones to make them blend. I could do the cell shading where it's just a solid edge of color. 
Then I've got a radial gradient coming from the moon, rating, aiding out in a circle, like light, light from a light source goes in all directions. And so then I've got the effect there. Um, I could further go in and play with those clouds, make them semi-transparent. Um, remember, you can change the alpha of colors. Right now they're 100. And go change those colors. I can go into my moon layer, select a cloud, for example. I'm not going to do them all, but I could select a cloud. Colors of that. Set its alpha. Depending how you draw it. But at that point, so I've got this parallax background. I wanted to make it even more complex. The uh, tombstones, those are at different depths, perhaps. So make those move around some amount of space as well by further changing their layers. So more layers, more perspective, more depth. The most background layer moves the slowest because it's moving the least. Let's break this and then we'll take a break. Let's break it down further with what's happening here that first keyframe, final keyframe of the moon layer moves very little pixel wise, X and Y coordinates. Middle ground layer moves double the amount of space. And then the foreground, most foreground layer moves four times more. So basically one and two and four gives you a good amount of space. If things are too fast, too slow, well, add or remove the amount of position, the amount of pixels, and then you get that effect, parallax background. So let's take our first break here, and then uh, we'll do a little bit more. Here's our project so far. It's 113. We'll take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 123.
So let's go on. There's a couple more things. So this um, this parallax scrolling background um, versus a looping background, and then a final thing on sound, and then exporting. Uh, so let's do that. At the moment, this project works or is playable if someone has Adobe Animate. Well, obviously, we can't assume that because if this is going to be uploaded to YouTube, for example, uh, it doesn't accept uh, an, an Adobe file. It has to be a real video file. So that'll be exporting. That'll be the last thing. Let's talk about a looping background. So we'll do this on scene two. We've got scene one. where this is working on, I'll call this maybe parallax, just to remind me that this scene is about parallax, then make a new scene, call this one looping. See the difference here. The big idea with, with a looping background is every element, uh, every starting element matches every ending element for it to loop. And therefore, having something like on scene one, where we've got a moon, which will never match, the moon is not gonna suddenly appear again on the top right corner, that type of element is not going to work on a looping background. The other parts, however, will, where we've got the, um, the, the floor and the tombstones and such. So keep that in mind for looping. So I'm gonna start with, uh, we're gonna keep it very, very simple. It's just gonna be, I don't know, rolling hills or whatever, maybe a tree once in a while, but just hills. And um, we will do this. We've got this background. We've got layer one. We'll just call this uh, G main. Here, I'll draw a simple, Hills, maybe put a tree, one tree. Something like this where it's um, a tree or whatever in the middle. This can all be edited later, of course, but a starting point there. I want to turn that to a symbol. I want to then um, refine it. But for the moment, before we refine it, actually, before we refine it, let's turn it to a symbol. So I drew that and um, going to select it all, F8, call this BG tree, maybe. So here's how we can make sure that this is a properly looping background. On the left side of it, side of my drawing, this needs to align with the rightmost side of my drawing. Don't do anything yet, but consider this. If I were editing this, do anything yet, but if I were copied the whole thing and make it line up like that, If I were to loop this moving left and right, that looks like, okay, it's connected, it's gonna loop over. The problem is notice the sort of X and Y coordinates here versus the X and Y coordinates here. This point here versus this one point up here. So we're doing this swing. So okay. touches the, the, the loop when it loops over. So I'm gonna undo all of this. Again, don't do any of this yet. 
what I will do, what you, what you, what you should do right here is on the, um, take all of these back. So we just drew this, we turned it into a symbol. That's where we're at. Okay, from here, you can double click the uh, background to edit it in place and start to set up a few of these guides. These will definitely help. And so at the very least, a horizontal guide that is somewhere around there representing the leftmost piece of your drawing. It doesn't have to be in the exact pixel. You, know, you don't have to zoom in 500% and put it exactly there, but that's gonna be your guide that this is the lowest it's got to be. Or then on the right side, over here somewhere, it connects. So that means now I need to maybe redraw this a little bit so that I know that the end of this hill ends a little bit closer to the start. It doesn't have to end right here before I finish my drawing. It has to, it, it probably you want it somewhere out over here. But the way I drew my hill going in that direction, it's not going to loop properly when I connect the other side. So I'm going to go in and maybe make the loop come up somewhere over here. Refine my original drawing. So the parts in between can do whatever, but the beginning and the ending should be close to each other so that then when we duplicate the current background onto itself, there's a loop. So make sure that you've got some guide and that you follow that guide at the end. Once I've got that, I'm gonna do a Control A, select all, Control C to copy, Control V to paste. Either with my mouse selection tool or with the arrows on the keyboard holding Shift right, I'm gonna move this over to the right. Oh, that copy. That copy is going to be close, similar, exact, whatever. It's going to be near the point. Don't move it up and down. It's got to be horizontally the same. If the bottom of that from the leftmost matches it on the right. Should be pretty good. The difference here between the previous par parallax, we didn't care where the starting line and the ending line was. We just drew some long background that then we tweened based on multiple layers. Looping background, it's very important that the beginning and the ending of the backgrounds match up so that they loop. And in the old cartoons, in the old days, the old Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry cartoons, when Tom and Jerry are running across the hallway and the same door appears over and over and over, well, they literally had a piece of paper that's like, you know, five feet long and they drew a background and they make sure that that first drawing of the hallway matches the last one a foot later and so you have this really long strip of, of a drawing. And then when they animate it, they, they can loop it on actual paper. Here digitally, we have the guide. So this is all happening inside of the symbol. If I go back to my main scene, I will also set up. So I had guides inside of the symbol. And then I've also got guides I could also make guides on the main timeline, and I will. So here, I'm also going to make it again, um, putting some guides somewhere around there, the final end of that drawing, or the beginning of the drawing.
Take about five seconds to animate this. Frame 120. F6 on frame 120, something's gonna change. I'm gonna move this over from the right to the left, either the mouse or the arrow keys. I like the arrow keys, shift, move that over to the left. Oops, not that far, but it's gonna move over to, so it's not that you're moving over the final edge all the way to the right also. No, what you're doing is, well, you've got a copy that you first drew, then you copied and pasted it. So then you've got a copy of it right there. And then, okay, where do I put it? Got to make that, you've got to make that line up there. So the second copy of it, it's got to line up like that. That's why you're also doing this outside of the stage. You need to give yourself a little bit of, of, of buffer, of safety outside of things. Back on the first, and then you can go back and forth. Uh, remember with the comma or the period, you can go back and forth. So on the first keyframe, starting point there, the leftmost point is lined up pretty well there. Then on the right, and then when it moves over, it's um, moved over some amount, lines up on the left side. Between those, right click and classic tween. I do test scene. Remember, we've got the previous scene. I don't want to wait for that to animate before we get to this one. I want this one. And anyway, if this were to play, if you did a regular control test, it's going to play your parallax, then it's going to get to this, and you're not going to get a good sense of is this really looping? Because it's going to loop back to scene one. So you want to do a control test scene. There it is. I need to go in and refine it, of course. But what if I then put my little character there uh, in its own symbol? I have a walk cycle of my character just moving back and forth, just walk cycle in a symbol. And I have the character just standing right here on these coordinates right here. And what's moving is the background, not the character. The background is walking in place, but the background, but the character is not being tweened. From place to place, the background is moving. The background is scrolling to the left, which this is again the backwards of it. The background is scrolling to the left. The character will look like it's moving to the right. Opposites. Again, to completely visualize it, you can do this optionally if you want. Let's have a character. It's, I'm not actually going to make it be walking, but a character on its own layer. Um, imagine it's, well, how about this? Okay, not, not a character with legs. How about a car? That way the car, um, the wheels. You say I want them to rotate and such, but what if I just have something like that. Oh, look at that car driving along. Well, the car's not moving. The um, background is what's moving. That little car that I drew there, I could turn that into a symbol on its own symbol. Let me the wheels turning, walk cycle, wheels turning. And um, it's the background that's moving, not the actual character. There's just so many ways to animate, so many tricks for animation. And what we've got going on here is a little car driving along. Maybe it's too small compared to the background. Maybe the background's far. I should probably make the car larger. If I really wanted to polish it, I'd put it in its own symbol and such. I won't do that. That's something you can play with. But we, we've built up all of these pieces along these several weeks. We have to spend a lot of time on just getting used to the software. That's one of the big hurdles with any apps. How does it work? Where's the button? Where's the tool? What is this menu? And there's still plenty to learn menu-wise. We, we didn't cover everything either. Uh, hopefully on your own, you're learning more. But 
after learning the software, then okay, now it's a little bit of drawing. We threw in the character creation. Maybe m most of you, when you the, come to, to this class, you usually have some ideas of characters and such. Most of you are artistic that come to this class, but then you were refined or guided in terms of let's do a model sheet. Have you ever drawn your character sideways, back view? What are the colors of your character? And we talked about story and uh, plot and um, biography of the character. Then, okay, that's all coming together. My character is going to be in some adventure, storyboard, uh, visuals about what I'm going to try to animate. And obviously that sounds daunting. Ooh, animation, that's a lot. We've seen so much animation in various ways, frame by frame animation, tween animation, uh, motion, motion tween animation, uh, warp tool animation, making things rotate, grow, shrink, fade in, fade out, lots of animation techniques. If you think animation is only one thing, it, it can be a lot. Here's one of the latest ones. Make a background move while the character doesn't. If you look back, if you think back on the examples of the uh, students' work that I previously showed, and you break it down, you see that they're applying all of these things learned. And the ones that look more refined are the ones that just took longer for amounts of time. So you all voted to give yourself more time for, the, for that project, so these better be amazing. <laughs> give yourself two more weeks. So final two things sound, and then exporting, because obviously this project is complete and amazing, and I need to publish it. So sound, yes, week, where we have them. So back on week five, uh, we put more items in there about uh, sound resources back on week five resources there. What was that on part one? Uh, no, here we go, sound. So back on week five, I had the YouTube audio library, the Full Metal Alchemist. No, I mean the uh, Free Music Archive um, library. We had Free Sound, we had Mixture and Ben Sound. So from Canvas, or I'll, I'll drop a few on the... Uh, web design folder in a moment, but let's say over on free sound. Go to free sound. Let's see if there's any scary sounds in here. Search scary, scary monster, laugh, dark, scary castle hall, dark, scary castle entrance. Seem to be more like sound effects rather than sound tracks, or is there a way to filter these sounds, people? Ambient, let's see, atmosphere. Scary music. I'm going to play these, but not for those of you at home at the moment, just here in the room. It's just going to be one note for 16 seconds. I guess that's scary. Very atmosphere. Close enough. So let's say I want to use that. From this particular website, okay, I'll click on that to see details. Oh, there's a download button there. Log in to download. Whoops, okay. I guess it doesn't, isn't a direct, give me the file. I have to down, I have to log in first. So, remind there. So, okay. Uh, I don't have an account. So, you have to create an account and then you can download it. It used to be on many of these sites, you can just easily download. Now, here's another one, um, Pixabay. 
they're focused on pictures, but they also have sound, music, sound effects and music. So Pixabay is another place to get music for your projects. Let's try there. So Pixabay, put the filter for music. Let's see what we have with scary. Seems adequate. So I can click the download button. It's pretty direct download. This, you can either find your own, it's the easiest here. Just go to pixabay.com, P I X A B A Y. Search any music you want. You probably won't be able to hear it unless you have headphones. But uh, let's say that's scary music. So now I need to get it into my project. File, import to library. And your download. It's in my project now. My particular sound, depending on your own sound, I can visually see that it's kind of low for a while and then it starts up a little louder. So Adobe Animate has kind of some limited sound editing tools. There's other apps that let you edit sound a lot better, um, but we have at least the ability to kind of crop the sound a little bit. Maybe I wanna crop out this starting point here to start here, maybe a little bit of basic fading in and such, nothing too complex, other software is better but I want this sound to happen on my scene one, back on scene one here, make a new layer, call it music. And the recommendation is to have your music layer as your bottom most layer. Nothing goes wrong if you don't have it there, but when you've got multiple layers, if you know that your sound layer is always at the bottom, you can find it easier. Frame one of my new music layer, select frame one, and then the properties. At the moment, there are no properties of sound on frame one of my music layer. So I can easily change that to that sound. In order to do some basic editing, as you can see here visually, it's very quiet for a while. Then the music comes up. I want to crop out that sound. You have the abilities here. Fade in, fade out, or very fancy edit sound envelope. And that's a way to, when you click that, you get this panel here which I'm surprised, this is, this is the same panel that they've had for like 15 years. They've never really updated it. It's, it's very clunky. What this is supposed to be showing you is you've got this amount of frames of the music. And then as this, um, as this playhead plays over here, it goes on. You know, if you scroll this to the right, there's where I actually get sound. So not until like the third second do I actually kind of hear some meaningful sound? So it's kind of empty for one and a half seconds. I don't like that. I'm gonna crop that out. So you can grab this left edge and say, yeah, crop out all that emptiness. It's, I, it's surprising you can't even resize this thing very easily to work with it. This is a long forgotten screen of Adobe Animate because I guess basically they want you to use their other editing apps like Audition. Adobe has graphics with Photoshop, with Illustrator, animation with Animate, sound editing with Audition, video editing with um, Premiere. So I guess they're trying to funnel you over to the other apps because this is a very, very bad tool 
for editing sound. It's very quick. Quickly crop the edges out, add some basic fade in, fade out, but nothing beyond that. By grabbing that edge there, now I start in one and a half minutes in instead of four seconds, instead of wait, instead of having silence. Click OK on that. I test the movie. Actually, I like that piano way better than um, all that silence. So I got to go back in. Maybe if I zoom out here, where's the piano? Way over there. So actually, I should crop it way over here. Zoom in and zoom out. That vaguely helpful, or do I have to go all the way there? Uh, that'll be good there. So you can pause it and play it there, figure out where do I want my sound to start? Oh, and then also, okay, so I, I did crop it this far out. But one thing that you also have to keep in mind when you edit the sound, it also depends on which synchronization it happen, It has. The default is event. Uh, with event, basically, it ignores how you edited the sound. If you cropped it, it just starts it at the beginning of the sound file. That's annoying. I picked the perfect envelope to start it and stop it in a perfect place. It ignores it. You need to set it to stream. That way, it'll synchronize to the stream of your frames. And the back and forth of that, or the um, trade-off, I mean, of that, is that then the five-second animation ended here. Therefore, my sound ended here. There's that trade-off. If you want to edit your sound, to crop pieces of it and such, you have to set it to stream. But then when it's on stream, it will only play what is visible on the timeline. If you want it to always play at the whole time, Keep it on event. But if you, um, but then, but then that negates using the cropping of the sound, but maybe it's one or the other. On the assignment, it is noted to set your sound to stream, but depending on which you need, you can set it to event or start. So depending on the length of your sound and the, the length of your animation and so forth, um, either of these will work fine. Event or start, if you leave it on the default, that'll work fine. So if at this point my project is complete, in order to turn it in, in order to upload it to extra credit, YouTube or Twitch and such, this needs to be converted into uh, a final video file. At the moment, my project is an FLA file. If you've been looking at your project folder, you'll notice that I have the FLA file. And as you're working with your test movie, it creates an SWF file. As you are working temporarily, it creates this recover file in case everything crashes. Once you save and close, the recovery file goes away because it's safe and protected. But every time you test a project, when you do control test movie, it creates one SWF file, one Swift file that is the whole project. If you, if you only test a scene, it'll create 
a file of that scene when we were here on Monday. I was testing each of these individual scenes, so they're all there. But these Swift files, these SWF files, are not regular video files to be consumed by the platforms. You need to convert them into MP4s, a basic universal video type of file. So let's take a moment to learn about that. Uh, I have it in the week six, uh, how to do the exports. We can replay those in a moment. I'll show you right now live. So my project, I need to convert it from this FLA file, this animate file into a uh, real video file. So file, export. Just the better one. File, export, video slash media. Export movie makes it sound like it's the right one. That's for, that, that's for different purposes. We want export video and media. You can also do an animated GIF, a static one image, specific assets of an image. We're going to want the video, export video. Get this panel here. You can resize the dimensions of your movie. Obviously don't, we want it in HD. Although you could set this up as a 4K video. If you add the dimensions of 4K, I have to look up what those are. I don't have them memorized but you, you can set dimensions here to make a 4K file. I wouldn't recommend it at the moment. So HD size, ignore stage color, that doesn't matter. We've got our own colors. You're gonna make your own layers with your own colors, leave that alone. Do you only wanna export a certain scene? You can do that. No, you want the whole movie. You wanna go with certain scenes with certain frames and the like, you can do that. No, we want the whole movie. Do we want to export within a certain amount of time? which doesn't make sense because Animate doesn't really show you your project in hours, minutes, and seconds format. It shows it to you in frames. I think you can go into the settings somewhere and have it show me, um, have it show me HMS, but we're dealing with frames on, uh, on default. So do the whole movie. We've got a couple of formats here. MP4, PEG4, install the latest version of Adobe Media Encoder and restart Animate to export using this preset. Whoops. All right. Well, let's try something here. Doesn't. Oh, okay. Most likely, when you got Adobe Animate at home and you installed it, most likely it did install this missing thing here. For whatever reason, ours here in the lab didn't install it. Uh, so I'll show both these ways. Um, I guess if it's QuickTime, we'll probably be okay. Prefer. MP4, it is a smaller file, but we need the extra media encoder, which I'll look at in a moment. So I'm just gonna select the uh, QuickTime here. There's a space, where would you like to save this to? So make sure you're saving it to where you think you're saving it. I'll put mine on the desktop temporarily. I keep the default, QuickTime default. I'll address the MP4 in a moment. Export. Creating a different type of file, it's an MOV file rather than an MP4 file. Let's see, what does that look like? So on the desktop, it's my video. There it is, is a plain old video file. Yes, it's encoded in RLE format, which isn't supported. Hmm, okay. It depend on the version of Windows or Mac and such. So let me try that again. File export video. Thank you. 
So maybe QuickTime won't work. We do need MP4. So in order to do this part, it says install the latest version of Adobe Media Encoder. Okay, I guess we'll do this. Over on the, uh, when you installed Adobe, it should have installed the Media Encoder. If it didn't, under the Adobe Creative Cloud app, it should have installed that one. This controls all the apps. Yeah, I only see Photoshop, Animate, and not Media Encoder. Well, if you pay for the subscription, if you got the subscription, it's all included. Yeah, I guess you have to take this extra step, Adobe Creative Cloud. That'll open up. That'll check your account. I don't know if we'll be able to do that, do this in this lab because it's locked maybe to the school computers. I don't know. We'll see. But on your own computer, of course, you have the full capabilities. We'll let this start up in a moment. We have to add, we have to activate this app that's part of your subscription, but it's an extra addition. And there might be an update necessary. So wait for that to happen. I'm up one moment. I bet they motioned tweened those animations. When this starts up, first time takes a moment. Subsequent times are a little bit faster. access to manage apps, permissions, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I thought that maybe on our computers here, we won't be able to add that. So I think since we pushed the deadline to two more weeks, let's not worry about it at the moment about exporting. I think I'll change the assignment just to say upload your FLA file. That will be acceptable. I would rather upload it at, well, then there's the extra credit. Well, it's extra credit. So if you do that. So I can't show it at the moment because it's locked on these computers. But the process would be that uh, if I do want to select MP4 to upload to YouTube and the like, export video. In order to select MP4, I do need the Adobe Media Encoder. You activate it from your Creative Cloud app. Under apps, you're going to see a button there that says activate or whatever. That'll take a moment. It'll activate. Then when that's all set up, then I go back to animate, and then I tell it to do it, and it'll do it. But we're kind of locked at this point because of the lab uh, credentials and such. So for, the, um, for you at home, try that out. If you have the software at home, try to do all of these steps and turn it into an MP4. The MP4 will be just for the extra credit. So I'll change the, uh, the assignment in a moment that the MP4 will only be for the extra credit. At least upload your FLA file because that's your complete movie. And if you want the extra credit, you have to do the extra step of having Adobe Media Encoder so that it converts it, so that it's convertible to a file that is uploadable to YouTube or Twitch or Newgrounds or whatever video app and then you can uh, get extra credit if you publish it that way. So this is uh, basically all of the knowledge. Obviously, they're still on your own. You can further practice and work, but we have all of these pieces of knowledge out of, for using this app. And this is sort of a lifetime endeavor, uh, even if we had, even if you were an expert in the software on day one of the summer, you'd still need the whole summer to of just work to make an amazing um, Disney-style movie. You have 
you had to learn the software, practice with the software, and now apply the software in a very short time. And obviously, the totality of it is that you're going to earn a certificate at the college, which is a stepping stone for then you to further go on to San Diego State, UCSD, the Art Institute, Harvard, whatever, to then go there for what, two years more, four years more of drawing, animation, interactivity, backgrounds, writing, scripting, whatever you decide to focus on, on this industry, get better and better and better. Because one summer, you're not really hireable yet, of course. But it is to show you, yeah, this is interesting. This is complicated. I want to learn more. Or this is complicated. I never want to look at it again. Or I like this part of the job more than that. I'd rather focus on the character drawing than the animation. I'd rather focus on the storyboarding or scripting than the drawing. I'd rather focus on the text, et cetera, et cetera, because in the world of animation and gaming, there's all of those aspects of things, not just the, um, not just the uh, very visible visuals right here. So we're going to wrap up in just a moment and uh, do some lab time. So, uh,